for the enemy of good. So, you know, whichever way I look at PB, moving resources, changing resources into communities is PB for me. And I can tell you a little bit about one of our uh, things we've been doing at the end that fits into that. Um, and I guess, you know, the title for this could have always been, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know, so we are always um, looking at local authority funding, other funders that hasn't been available to me. But I think I want to show you that with relationship building with funders, with other people, there are ways to bring um, quite a serious amount of investment into a local community. So um, just next slide, please. Thanks, Sam. So this is where we are. I'm in that we sit in that very red bit around Lock End, Restorig and Craig and Tinney. So our area um, and we're quite a tight area, which is a benefit to PB. So we are 6,000 households. We are in the we have seven data zones in the top 20 percent deprived areas in Edinburgh. And three of those are in the top five percent. So our geography is tight, which works well for us. But we're also um, very um, focused on the area that, that we want to provide additional um, investment into. So really this started with um, coming to the Ripple, understanding PB, knowing about the community grant scheme. A lot of you will have heard about Leith Chooses and recognising that there was no investment in our area. So Leith Chooses uses the community grant funding given by the council um, to um, build its coffers and that wasn't available to us. There's no other community grant funding scheme in Edinburgh that is used in a, or is delivered in a participatory budgeting way. So I did my usual, started with the, the group. So I became a member of the community grant scheme funding panel for our area um, and tried for three years to um, advocate for that money to be distributed through participatory budgeting even to the point of suggesting so our community grant fund um, focuses on 10 villages and I was kind of like well give me three three tenths and let me do something with mine um, or with that bit for our area um, and that was knocked back and it was knocked back two or three years so I thought right I'm just going to go and do it myself so we spoke to um, Awards for All initially had approached us in terms of them looking at a pilot for um, distributing funds through a community anchor organisation. So in effect, we became a grant holder and that enabled us to access monies um, of around about £10,000 that were then distributed to organisations and individuals within our community by a very simple application form. And we had money left over at the end of that. And I said, look, can I put that forward to a PB project? And they said, yes. So if you move to the next slide, Sam, you'll see that that built up over the last three years. So we've brought in an investment of, you know, over six to seven thousand pounds to our area over the last three years, none of which has come from any local authority funding. So we had um, Development Trust Association. You can all read it. I'm not going to read it out. Um, so Port of Leith, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to read it out. So we've got Port of Leith Housing Association. So we live in a building that is uh, rented from Port of Leith and they've been really supported with that. We were successful with ICC, IIC funding from Scottish Government. Um, we've received donations, Capital City Partnership, the National Lottery, that 1752 is the bit left over from Awards for All. And the other was uh, is a bigger package that we've got from them that has been... Um, weaved into bigger applications so that's not a pb fund so twenty thousand of national lottery funding has come through our site how our um improving lives fund and our connected led by the community fund and it's been um included in that as a way to um achieve some of the targets and the outcomes that the lottery wanted to see and then the ripple we had um a gap uh, that we didn't know where we would get funding from. So we, the Ripple used its reserves to put £5,000 in to a um, participatory project with young people in one of our local primary schools. So over three years, you know, that's not insignificant. Um, we get a lot of um, inquiries about it. We get a lot of people asking about it. Um, and we are, we are seeing that we're going to move on so we've done two years of a community event. 
we've done one year of working in primary schools and we're going back to community events over the next two years. I could have the next slide, please, Sam. So the key points from, you know, from our UB work, and as you'll all know, it goes beyond the actual money that's been invested. So we have channeled another £67,000 into a, you know, a really deprived community. We've had 400 people involved in the planning, delivery and voting phases. Um, there's some of the case studies on the SCDs on the, the PB Scotland website. Um, we introduced a telephone voting system in our first year, which I think is quite unique, where people could just, we, we leafleted every household, um, gave them the choices, and then people could phone up and leave their votes for three of the um, projects that were being suggested. In the second year, we added in post um, post box voting to that in local shops. So we had telephone voting, post box voting, and the community event. So there are now twenty five new projects being delivered in our area, um, and ten people, which will move up to fifteen twenty this year, have completed a six month planning process, and have training in planning and delivering. Um, I think I'm going to pause a minute and sort of let you know. So there is, there is a benefit to having more autonomous control over the funding that we've received because it's not come from the local authority. So we were able, or the steering group were able to make those choices around, could an individual apply? Yes, they could. Could it be an unconstituted group? Yes, it could. You know, when we worked with people around how to um, manage governance, bank accounts risk around that, um, but it wasn't a barrier to then people being able to submit proposals. One of the proposals that we had in the first year has actually um, enabled a, 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 an individual to start their own business based on the PB funding. You know, the cost benefit analysis of that is beyond the pound per pound that went into the PB project and that's still running. Um, there are if you'll actually next slide, Sam, I'll just give you a few ideas of, so, you know, one of the biggest differences we've seen is that it's not particularly been for outputs. So it's not been that bench that somebody wanted or um, a staff member in order to deliver a project. It's been very locally focused on the ground projects that local people have come forward to both submit as an application and then vote for. Um, Next one, actually, please, Sam, that's just the communication stuff. So, for instance, we've got a little, you know, we've got a guitar group that just needed a Bluetooth speaker. So they bought, they were voted successfully for, they bought a Bluetooth speaker. But that guitar group is now using the Ripple building on a Friday morning to come together to play guitar. So it goes beyond, as we know, you know, the original project. The next one, please. This is the uh, individual that's turned it into a business. Um, and it so business slash social enterprise in terms of employment for other people. So we had um, somebody that wanted to do silent discos in the community. Um, you know, so if you think about that in terms of a pump prime investment of 1850, in terms of setting up something that has now gone on for three years in terms of that person, their own employability, and also what's offered in the community. The next one, please. And then I guess really, you know, again, focused um, opportunities for that are really honed to our community. So, again, it's not, um, you know, a staff member of a bigger organisation looking to deliver things. It is around that um, evidence informed information that people have that then provides an additional service and opportunity in our area. So she's Scotland um, worked with us to deliver a 12 week program, as you can see there, around emotional and physical well-being of girls. That then translated into when we did the youth project in the schools, people already knew about it. Um, and the, the, the school actually, we provided a budget of 5,000, but the, they've actually only spent three and a half thousand for a board game club, um, a Lego club, period products in um, bathrooms throughout the school and a gymnastics club. So, you know, there's a definite effect around that, um, just getting it out there as to actually, yeah, you can be involved in how money is spent. 
And just my last two minutes, I just want to tell you about the other elements that are PB in their widest form in terms of, you know, providing resources to our community. So we've been working with roads, the roads department. We brought together um, a citizens meeting around roads um, in a very non-confrontational, non-aggressive way where the roads guy could explain how roads were prioritised in our area. And this came about because we were only being allocated 1.2% of the roads budget. So community members argued, or yeah, well, I've just said they didn't argue, you know what I mean? They discussed that, you know, people in our area have less resilience to poor roads. If you get a flat tire, people can't replace their tire. If an older person falls over, it's a hip, you know, it's not just to get on with your day. Um, and we're actually at the point of um, roads now reviewing how they prioritise roads, the roads allocation. Um, you know, to me, that's a massive PB win. That's a, a reallocation of resources potentially that affects the whole community. Um, ooh, I'm pleased I've hit my 10 minutes. So um, is there going to be time for questions afterwards if anybody wants to, David, or, af or after Rachel or... I think we'll get an opportunity in in the groups after after you've both both spoken, Rachel. But if anybody's got any particular questions, bung them in the chat, and you know, we can we, we can pick them up now from from there as well. But thanks Sweet. very much. That's great. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and anybody, please feel free to get in touch afterwards if you want to know more. That's great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, really interesting. Again, if anyone does does have questions, want to follow up in the discussion groups or um, ask ask Rachel in the chat. Feel free. Feel free to do so at the moment. Um, but in moving moving on, our second speaker this morning uh, is Rachel Searle, uh, who's Head of Communities and Impact at Foundation Scotland. Uh, and Rachel's going to talk a little bit about PB from a, a funder's perspective. Thanks. Thanks, David. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, great to see such a, such a busy room. Um, which I'm sure is full of so much, so much experience and, and commitment and um, how to follow Rachel, your your input there. That's great. The work you're doing is just so inspiring and your examples made um, all the hard work so tangible and um, meaningful. So thank you. That was a that was a very inspiring um, 10 minutes. Great, great to hear. Um, I'm just going to give a little input on um PB from from perspective of of Foundation Scotland, which is a, a curious beast as a funder, and some of you may know us, some of you may not. Um, so I hope this is uh, gives you a, a bit of food for thought or inspiration or or questioning. Um, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, just wait for Sam to move the slide on. So so just so just so you're aware, who Foundation Scotland is, we're an independent funder, and we're actually part of a network of community foundations, not only in the UK, um, where there are around 50 in the, across the UK, just ourselves in Scotland, but actually globally, a global movement of um, NGOs that is um, committed really to trying to do its bit to um, do a bit more of Robin Hood, really. So so how, how, how do you kind of uh, acquire, acquire, acquire money from those who have wealth? <laughs> Uh, without completely changing the global economic system, which maybe is what needs to happen, um, and and kind of be involved in re redistributing that, and and it's very community foundations are very place based. Um, we're quite unusual in being we're we're we're, in, we're actually national in in England. There are about forty six community foundations, mainly kind of county county based, much more parochial. Um, we 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 look after other people's money it's not our own money we're not sitting on a big endowment or some big uh, you know benefactors money we, we look after other people's money um and uh it's generally money that comes to us because the people who have either earned it or inherited or landed on it don't want to set up an independent legal entity involving auditors and boards and other forms of governance um uh through which to to distribute that that money so they hold it under our kind of governance governance roof um last year we distributed about uh, uh just uh, under under 24 million and uh that that seems to be going up in these in these hard difficult financial financial times because these these challenging financial times are, are challenging uh, for some, but not others, uh, you know, as we know, some people have done very well out of the recent economic crisis. 
um, and current cost of living crisis. And we operate through three kind of um, uh, three externally facing teams, social investment team, philanthropy team and communities team, which I lead the latter. Thanks, Sam. Um, what drives us? Well, um, certainly we try and align our work with the SDGs and which globally community foundations all do. And in different ways, we're committed to supporting people and places to thrive, to acting fairly and supporting others to act fairly and to protecting our planet. And um, we we juggle our work around these kind of uh, seven different themes, which all, of course, um, in, in, interconnect. Um, but in the in the top right, supporting resilient, thriving and empowered communities is very much at the heart of the of the of the communities communities work. Thanks, Sam. Um, behind the scenes, though, Foundation Scotland's a bit of a curious beast, and this is um, you can just um, pull them all up, Sam. Thanks. There are two others. Um, because of because of uh, our expertise in distributing other people's money it therefore means that we manage a lot of different donor funds so those come from different sources they might be individuals with wealth they might be families with wealth they might be companies based in scotland or the wider uk that want to invest in scotland they might be um other trusts or foundations that might want to do some work in Scotland and don't have a presence or base in Scotland. That means we operate a multitude of different types of funding programmes, some of which are national, some of which are thematic, and some of which are hyper-local and very geographically bound. And that therefore means that we already operate a range of decision-making arrangements across all our funds. It is, although our trustees have legal responsibility for any money that sits with Foundation Scotland, they don't actually, they rarely make decisions on the funds that are under our jurisdiction. Um, all those donor funds that we support have their own decision making arrangements. And within the communities team, um, thanks, the next slide, Sam. Within the communities team, the decisions on funds, strategy and spend already sits with local communities. So I'm just going to focus on that just for a few minutes. Um, our, our first kind of um, foray with, with PB was through a piece of work um, that was linked to the Commonwealth Games. It was called the um, 14 programme in Scotland and it was funded. It was a three, four year programme supported by the Spirit of 2012 Trust, um, which was formed on the back of the sale of Olympic um, venues and um, 2012 Olympic venues. And they invested 250, um, quarter of a million in six communities in Scotland to basically try and promote health well-being. Um, two of the communities we supported, we were we were looking after that programme, two of the programmes we supported, one in Caithness and one in, um, uh, in South Glasgow, were very committed to PB and uh, learnt a lot from the PB network as it was at that point, as it was then, and um, developed some really, really great work in those communities. It was very much about um, those examples you gave, Rachel, were very, uh, were, were, were very much akin with the hyper-localised um, nature of those PB processes. What that, what that gave us was a bit of confidence and learning about operating PB because alongside programmes like the 14 programme, we have anyway since about 20, um, 2008 been um, developing work on community benefit funds across Scotland. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with these. Um, they're linked with renewable energy, energy um, projects and they provide um, funding into communities primarily of place. Um, there's about 26 million a year at the moment coming into Scotland's communities through community benefit funds. And um, if the rate of um, renewables projects in goes at the pace it's supposed to go, which might not happen, um, by 2030, that should increase to about 60 million per annum coming into Scotland's communities um, from renewable energy projects of different types of technologies. Through the work that we do, we're committed to those community benefit funds being driven by the communities 
which they serve um, and we support um, over 450 actually volunteers who are either panel members or members of community companies that look after that money. So in some ways, um, depending on how we define PB, a level of PB is happening very, very actively across a lot of Scotland's communities at the moment through, um, uh, through the community benefit funds. Um, thanks, Sam. And certainly in those arrangements, the more familiar type of PB where whole communities get together and vote, as opposed to decision making being delegated to a smaller number of residents, certainly that wider um, practice of PB um, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an option for um, is an option for funding distribution. And um, certainly it, it does it does happen and it widens the established practice of community decision making and it gets more people more people involved. There's piecemeal practice to date across our community benefit portfolio, but we've used it, for example, when we're setting up a fund a couple of years ago, we were setting up a large community benefit fund um, supporting some communities in East Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway. And we managed to um, obtain a, a, a budget from the developer that could be wholly focused on doing some PB work with children and young people through the schools and established youth services in that area, simply to give those young people, as, as Rachel said, you know, an opportunity to be involved in thinking and, and working out how money can be spent. So it was quite an empowering opportunity for those children and young people and trailed the opportunity that over the next 25, actually 30 years, they can be in, involved in that kind of experience in their community more broadly should they should they stick around so we design in pb beyond the standard practice of um, funding decisions already sitting with local people we design in wider pb processes when we can um, we talk actually more about participatory grant making in this context rather than participatory budgeting that might me just be me getting hung up on semantics but it feels important in this context and there is always very much a focus, as you'll all be aware, on community connecting and celebrating. Thanks, um, Sam. Challenges are familiar. You know, uh, you know, it can be resource intensive. It can be complicated. There's potential for conflict, and sometimes there are capacity challenges. Um, where we can, we sometimes team up with the local authority if they have a team of, you know, if they do have a CLD team or if they do have practitioners who are already involved in delivering PB locally. Um, we've got one um, example at the moment in Fife where we've teamed up with the CLD team who have a budget for some PB work and the panel we're supporting in this particular community were keen to try some PB. And so we've teamed up and we've the money therefore has, has increased, which is great. The money's coming together. And we're, we're doing that in partnership. And um, we launched it a couple of weeks ago at a coffee morning and there is a process of applying and there'll be an event in May where decisions will actually be made. So these challenges will be familiar to all of you. Um, sometimes in a, in a context where money is already available in that community, these challenges become even sharper. Um, sometimes actually the fact that they know that more money is coming the following year actually dilutes some of the challenges because it doesn't feel like it just once in a once in a lifetime opportunity. Thanks, Sam. And so opportunities you'll be you'll be familiar with. We, we've experienced that the PB really builds confidence, ownership and agency, certainly enhances the fund's reputation. And we think there is a better opportunity going forward to actually build in more deliberate participatory budgeting rather than participatory grant making linked to local plans and fund strategies. It's been quite hard to coordinate locally to do that to date, but we will have some opportunities going forward where people can really begin to plan forward with these funds coming into their communities. Thanks, Sam. And then just, just finally, um, uh, again, just to kind of leave you with a with a, with a few thoughts. I think I think apart from a funder perspective, part of our part of our challenge beyond just the community's team when we look at PB is often is often and they're kind of linked in terms of which funding purpose and language. You know, are we are we ultimately about trying to change systems in um, in terms of pub, you know how how money's resource allocations are made for for public funds? Or do we want to widen democracy in funding decisions? 
neither of those are right. You know, they're, they're, both, they're both right. There's not a single right or wrong. But sometimes I think we're we're unclear what we want the ultimate purpose of, of PB to do. Um, and maybe as long as locally the purpose is clear, that, that that's what's most important. However, from a funder perspective, looking looking from the outside in, that that's that's not always clear. The language thing um, can be confusing if we are just talking about participatory grant making, or we are actually talking about committing funds and budgeting funds going forward for a time. And I think in terms of frequency and impact, it's great hearing the stories and the anecdotes. But I think it would be great to get some more solid evidence about where and how whether it's participatory grant making or participatory budgeting is really making a difference to communities and um, and the, the the systems that they are that that they are part of. Whether they're hyper local systems of you know how um, <clears throat> you know how youth services are delivered, or whether it's something much 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 wider about um, what makes a place work. Um, just wanted to say as well, within our philanthropic kind of side of the organisation, to my knowledge, <laughs> we haven't distributed any money for PB exclusively. Um, now, that's likely because no, none of the funding programmes have sent out a message saying, here we are, apply apply for a apply for a grant that would enable you to do PB locally. But I was kind of really inspired by Rachel's um, your second or third slide there where she laid out how she'd managed to, by hook or by crook, um, you know, capture money. Um, and that for one bid, uh, you know, an element of a wider bid, I think, was for some PB activity. So I think that's really helpful. And it's certainly a message I'll take back to colleagues back at Foundation Scotland to be more, to, to, to be aware of that and to try and maybe develop some um, conversations with donors whose money they support to enable an openness towards that. And actually, to um, to 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 think about how we can better serve the the appetite to do more PB locally, irrespective of where the money comes from. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you.